around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. Pastor David Langford here today. We'd like to welcome you to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Tuesday, June the 16th, 2020. We trust that your day has already been filled with the power and the presence and the grace of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. God is your friend. He is your refuge. He is your strength. He is your high tower. He is the pavilion where you can run into that high and lofty place wherein Satan has no access to you to wound you or to hinder you in any capacity. God does not always allow us to stay there because our faith would not grow. Our trust in Christ would wane over a period of time. But God allows us to go into times of trial, affliction, and persecution. Why does he do that? That we would ever trust him, that we would not lean to our own understanding, but in all of our ways, we would acknowledge the Lord in everything that we seek to do should be in acknowledging the Lord. Acknowledge the Lord. Petition him. Pray. Share your heart with him. He knows everything anyway. I find it amusing when people think they can go to God in prayer and somehow hide or conceal something. He knows it's there. That's why we confess it. That's what keeps the believer pure. Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Regretfully, we've lost the element of purity in the church today. But I do believe before the second advent of Christ that purity will be restored. And those who have pure hearts, those who have clean hands, will be allowed to dwell in the holy temple of God. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart and hath not lifted up his soul in deception or deceit, you're going to be in the presence of the King of glory. Before we get back into the message today, when God heals thy wounds and thy bruises, we started that yesterday from Jeremiah chapter 30. I'm going to pick that back up today. But before we go into the message, listen to the words of Brian Free as he sings this old song entitled, O oh, what a Savior. No one, remotely, no one, no matter how many faults, gods, deities, religions there might be, no one holds a candle to Jesus. What a Savior, none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, a Redeemer, one who has redeemed us from our iniquities and from our sins. I was sitting here listening to the song, and I feel constrained by the Holy Spirit. I feel it is profusely imperative that we pray and we fast for this 2020 election. And as I was sitting here looking at the calendar, I'm going to ask everyone that will, November the 1st is a Sunday. We will vote on November the 3rd, a Tuesday. I'm asking everyone that will commit after lunch, after you eat dinner on Sunday, don't eat again until Tuesday. If you eat dinner at 2 o'clock Sunday, I would encourage you, please humbly, fast till 2 o'clock Tuesday 
And then Tuesday afternoon, spend a half an hour to an hour in prayer and intercession concerning this presidential election. I'm going to advocate and appropriate this. Hopefully, every program from here till November. I want you to get mentally, spiritually, physically prepared to fast two days. And on the day of the election, I want you to spend a half an hour to an hour on your knees and plead for God to move in this nation and not suffer, not suffer the ill-fated character of the wrong person to get into the White House and then begin to punitively punish, even more so, Christianity and godliness. I loathe, I despise the statement that Joe Biden made some weeks ago when he said Donald Trump ought to read what's in the Bible. What a loathsome hypocrite. Lying Biden. Sir, if you'd read the Bible, you would see that sodomy is wrong. Same-sex marriage is wrong. Abortion is wrong. You'd see that lying and liars will have their part in the lake of fire. You'd see that bribery, injustices, inequities, they are wrong in the sight of God. And I'm going to say, admittedly, most of the people today that profess Christianity, they're not who they say they are. Somehow they have become religious and they fail to have a relationship with God. If I were to ask, if I were to ask most guys who have their websites or their blog programs or whatever they have, sir, ma'am, if God demanded an answer of you this week, how much time have you spent on your knees in prayer? I'm not talking about riding down the road praying. I'm not talking about in the shower meditating or while I cut grass I'm thinking about God. I'm talking about disciplined prayer in the closet with God as Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6. Folks, it's just not there. It is just not there there. These people, Jesus called them hypocrites because they were feigning righteousness, but at the close of the day, their hearts were far from God. And many today are like that. And that's why so many people are deceived. Just because someone says they are a Christian certainly does not make them Righteous. Even Satan. Paul told us Satan has his own ministers. They're his. They're not God's. They're not Jehovah's ministers. They are Satan's ministers. And Satan's ministers are purveyors of falsehood and fallacy. Now, they don't see themselves as false teachers and false prophets, but they are. 2 Corinthians 11 14, 15, no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of unrighteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. These people are not God's called, God's elect, God's chosen, neither are they God's ordained. They are Satan's ministers. I don't think we understand the gravity of what the Apostle Paul said there. I actually misquoted that. I, I, I caught myself. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. I said unrighteousness. Satan wants to transform, make his ministers appear as they are righteousness, but they're not. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if 
his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. People argue works, promote works, deny works. Works don't save you. Works are a manifestation whether you are saved or not. Unsafe people like these ministers, they're going to be held accountable according to their works. They were evil works. They were false works. They were deceptive, duplicitous works. They were mendacious works. They were not godly works, but they appeared. They appeared to be as though they were godly, but they were not. Enough of that. I've been trying my best the last few weeks to encourage everyone listening to the broadcast. I've been trying to strengthen your hand, strengthen your heart, strengthen your mental, spiritual inner man. Because there is coming, sadly, days of pain, sorrow, We need to be prepared, but I've wanted to encourage your personage for the things that are coming. We read from Jeremiah chapter 30 yesterday, beginning at verse 17, where God says, For I will restore health unto thee, I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. Because they called thee an outcast. How many of us today from our families, our churches, our peers say we're nothing but outcast? Because they called us an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. Zion, Jerusalem was so ravaged, who would want it? Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents. And have mercy on his dwelling places, and the city shall be builded upon her own heap. God was going to restore, God was going to rebuild Jerusalem after their Babylonian captivity, and would build it on their heap, or as on a little hill. And the palace shall remain after the manner thereof, and out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of them that make merry, And I will multiply them, and they shall not be a few. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. May the Lord God add his rich blessings to his word today. As we shared with you yesterday, Satan is a master in trying to cause each of us to live in our past hurts, anomalies, and afflictions. But we must remember our past has no future, and our future is yet to have a past. The word the Lord gave me 25 years ago or so, forget the past, embrace the present, and I will take care of the future. If you have served the Lord very long at all, without a doubt you have suffered immeasurably. Some of it is of our own doing. Most of it, many times, more than not, is not of our own doing. I've said this so many times, and it is so true. It is so apropos. Many of us are suffering because of the sin of somebody else. A spouse whose spouse has been unfaithful, the one that's been true, legitimate, honest, forthright, suffers immeasurably when that other spouse has been disloyal and unfaithful. The loyal spouse 
has done nothing. Oh, maybe they didn't do everything right. And we all are guilty of that. But that unfaithfulness has marred, mutilated, eviscerated that other spouse. Irreparable damage has been done. God, however, can heal it. But that person suffers immeasurably hurt, pain, sorrow, suffering. And the person that committed the evil act indeed knows nothing about that emotional hurt that other person is dealing with. Sleepless, restless nights, confusion, doubt, fear, anxiety. And we know how the enemy can take our minds and run wild with our minds and we imagine all ungodly, perverted things because the devil takes advantage of a, of a weakness, of a harm, of an injury, of a wound. Satan takes advantage of all of those things in people's lives. Some of you have been so terribly, terribly wounded, it literally begs description. The grief, the pain, the sorrow. I've said this, and I'll say it again. Some, some have been chosen for a life of suffering. Your whole life has been a life of suffering, and it started as a child. It started when you were young. You were done wrong. Maybe your parents, like mine, divorced, and you suffered irreparable damage to some degree, but God nevertheless can heal all of those things. But as you grew up, this event, that event, this circumstance, that circumstance. You got married, an unfaithful spouse. You got a job, and the employer, he done you wrong. Some of you listening today, you would say, the Lord, he does not really care about me. He doesn't understand the gravity of my wound, neither does he understand the gravity of my hurt. But I can say, yes, he does. You see, that was the reason, that was the purpose in God becoming a man. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched, with the feelings of our infirmities or our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. This is why Jesus, God, became a man to fully understand our humanity. Now, theologically, we don't understand that. I, I cannot get my head around God who knows all things consist and everything exists by him and through him. Uh, Acts 17, 28, in him we live, we move, we have our being. Yet God became a man for the express purpose of being able to fully understand everything about our humanity. Satan does not understand your humanity other than its flawedness, weakness, and aptness. But Satan has never been human never will be human in that context. But God became a human that he could understand what it means to be wounded, what it means to be bruised. The prophecy in Psalms 41, verse 11, David said, My unfamiliar friend whom I did eat with hath lifted up his heel against me. David was talking about how he was wounded by those around him, but that prophecy spoke of Judas Iscariot that would seek to hurt Christ, and he bruised the hill of Christ. But Jesus bruised the head of the devil. My own familiar friend. Think of that phrase, familiar friend. That means someone I know very well, someone I'm close to, someone I love, someone I have cherished, someone I have shared so much with, my own familiar friend. 
And you know a lot about people when you're able to sit down and break bread. One of the greatest ways to learn about people and their personage is to have dinner with them. Multiple times you begin to witness mannerisms, feelings, thoughts, hurts, wounds, uh, joys, uh, excitements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All because of sitting down and having fellowship, breaking bread together. Let me say this. There's no doubt, as a minister of the gospel of Christ, I am unable to measure the emotional hurt that Christ suffered. None of us know the gravity, the despair, the depravity, the deprivation, the stress, the anxiety, the agony that Christ felt, endured emotionally. None of us can know his heart. We know according to Luke twenty two forty four, and being in an agony, he prayed the more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. In other words, the capillaries in his blood vessels dilated and they burst, thus instead of sweat, perspiration coming from his pores, he began to bleed from his pores. That's agony. And being in an agony, he looked into that cup, he said, Father, if at all possible, let this cup pass from me. He saw the debasedness and the debauchery and the sinfulness and the wickedness and the filth in that cup. Thus, as a man, he said, God, if there's another way, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That was the humanity of Jesus, yet the godliness in him said, no, we got to go the cross. We have to go the way of the cross. I cannot elaborate pontificate. I cannot share with you the enormity of the emotional grind and pain and suffering that Jesus endured, but I can tell you this. Where we fail, he did not fail. He could see beyond the cross. We, we so many times are unable to see beyond the wound, beyond the bruise. We're, we're unable to see the healing, the healing. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we're also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now think about that. I know that's a, that was a, a, a lengthy quotation there from Hebrews chapter 12. But think about, I want you to, em, em, I want to emphasize, I want you to, I want you to uh, uh, magnify, I want you to magnify what the Bible says. Looking unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, the author, he authored your faith. He started your faith faith. He deposited a, a, a grain of mustard seed in your life. Romans 12, 2, God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. God's given you a measure of faith already. Thus, he's the author, not only the author, but the finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him, the cross was before the joy See, he was nailed to a cross. He was wounded. He was bruised. He was chastised. He was eviscerated. He was spat upon repeatedly, buffeted, smacked, beat, crown of thorns, nailed to a cross. But who for the joy that was set before him, he could see 
the other side of the cross. He could see the resurrection. He knew this wasn't the end. This was only the beginning. Satan and his minions and his cohorts, oh, they thought this was the end, but this was only the beginning. Because the Bible says there in 2 Corinthians, if the prince of this world or the princes of this world had known what they have done, they would have never done it. Jesus dying enabled him to conquer death and hell and have the keys of death and hell. He could have never done that until he died. who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured all of that. Why? He could see Sunday. He could see the resurrection. Hallelujah. When he would walk out of that tomb, he told Pilate, no man takes my life. I lay it down. I will raise it up. John 2, 19, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Jesus is not a resurrection. Jesus is the resurrection. I'll never forget the day I saw that in my spirit. I'll never forget the day I felt that in my spirit. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm not a resurrection. I am the resurrection. Glory to God. I am the resurrection. Isaiah 52, verse 14, his visage was so marred more than any man. Visage, what you could visualize, vision-wise, what you could see, his visage was marred more than any man, the Son of God. Isaiah 53, verse 2 says, He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we would desire him. Had you seen Christ that day following the profuse beating with that whip mixed with glass, bone, and metal, And they hit his back 39 times. And every time that whip, that glass, that bone, that metal went into his back, they were plowing physical furrows in his back. Psalms 129, verse 3, the plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. The plowers. The plowers. Who were the plowers? You and I, oh, yes, it was the Roman soldiers, but you and I were just as guilty. He was wounded beyond any comprehension. Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, with his stripes, Peter said, we are healed, healed. You say, I can't be healed. Yes, you can be healed. You can be made whole. Hallelujah. Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, our sins. Jesus didn't live a life of sin. He died because we were sinners. We He was chastised so that we could have peace. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. They chastised him. They beat him. They whipped him. They marred him. They mutilated him. They spat on him that you might have peace. You, me. They did that to Christ. And with His stripes, that word stripes there in the Hebrew says, our peace was upon him and with his bruises, his bruises, 
we are healed. We are healed. A bruise is when there is a tearing underneath the external skin, the epidermis, what you, what you see at the back of my hand. But my hand can be hit, or I hit my hand against something. The flesh does not tear. But the next day you begin to see something blue and then purple and black and blue, these colors. What is that? That's the bruising. The, the blood has ruptured. The vessel has been stricken and smitten till it burst to a small degree. And so the blood, what you see in a bruise is blood. That's what, that's what you see when you see a bruise. That says somebody has been hit. Now, sadly, I've seen senior citizens. I'm one of them now, but fortunately, uh, God has been so gracious to my health. But people who take blood thinners, Coumadin, those kind of medications, you see their arms. You see all of these, these, these dark, burgundy, bluish black marks all over their arms. I don't have to ask them. I know they're on blood thinners because every time they hit something, they bruise. Older gentlemen, when they shave and they are taking blood thinners, if they accidentally cut themselves with the razor or just somehow some capacity, they bleed. But I'm talking about bruises. So you see the the bruising on the hands, the bruising on the arms, and they're, they're not intentional. They're all by accident when you're on a blood thinner. But Jesus and his bruises, there were none of them by accident. He was not on blood thinners. They were beating him to a pulp. Think about it. They blindfolded Jesus, and they smote him with the back of their hands. They smote him with a reed or with a rod, and they said, prophesy, tell us who smote you this time. Yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't say anything. He opened not his mouth. He has brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And the sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. I just, I, I just, I, I can't fathom that. I, 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 I can't, I can't relate to that because I, 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 I can't get into his mind. No, no doubt, no one could get into the mind of Christ at that moment. But you got to know, his humanity is wanting to. Retaliate. His humanity is wanting to stop this. His humanity is somehow wanting to say, please stop. Or in his humanity, he wanted to wield the power of the Holy Ghost and smite them all. But he did not yield to the humanity, but rather the Holy Ghost. And no doubt before he uttered the words, they were already in his mind in his heart, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So he opened not his mouth. Tell us, tell us who hit you this time. Tell us who smote you this time. The thief, oh, if thou art the Christ, deliver thyself and deliver us. Hammering, 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 persecuting, persecuting, eviscerating, Mentally, physically, emotionally eviscerating this man of God, Jesus the Lord's Christ. Yet, he opened not his mouth. Why? 
Why did he endure all of that and never retaliate, never say anything, just endured the suffering? He could see beyond the cross. God wants you and me and all of us today wants to look beyond our pain, our sorrow, our suffering, our hurt. He wants us to look beyond that. And I'm guilty, we're all guilty of dwelling in the past or negatively in the present. When God says, if you could just look beyond the pain, if you could look beyond the suffering, if you could look beyond the wound, if you could look beyond the bruising, you'll see something more. You will see, I can heal. Let, let me say this to you. Think about what I'm about to say. Even though Christ was the son of the living God, though he was the Messiah, the Redeemer, after the resurrection, they witnessed, they saw the wounds in his physical body, but they were utterly, totally, completely healed. Thomas, old Thomas, Except I see, you got to prove to me who you are. Jesus and his love, his long suffering, says here, Thomas, the nail scars in my hand. The nail scars in my hand. My side where they thrust the spear, when the Roman soldiers walked up and they thrust that spear into me, they thrust it, forthwith came blood and water. Again, demonstrating the humanity of Christ, blood and water. The pericardium sac around the heart is a sack of water, and that's what when a, you get hit playing football or, or basketball or rugby, soccer, you get hit, your heart does not lose a beat, doesn't lose its rhythm. Why? It's in that pericardium sac. And when they burst that or thrust that sword in his side, they burst that sack, and forthwith came blood and water. Jesus had the nail prints in his feet. And no doubt around his brow, his forehead, sides of his face, you could see where the, the crown of thorns were thrust in his head. And because of the thinness of the flesh, the thinness of the flesh on a man's skull, those thorns anywhere between three quarters of an inch to an inch to a half long, they, as they were pressed into his brow, they rent, they tore, they ripped the flesh from his skull. They just ripped it. And they all saw all the wounds, all the bruises. We don't talk about his back because he had a garment he was covered. But if there were wounds in his side, in his hands, in his feet, in his brow, there will be wounds in his back. We'll probably never see that because of the righteousness and holiness and modesty of God. But if they, those wounds were on him, they're on his back today. No doubt, when God the Father looks at the Son, this, this throne in Revelation chapter 5, this throne is so magnificent. And we see in verse 1, we see there's somebody on the throne that's the Father. And he had in his hand a book. And no man was worthy to open the book. We know that that has to be God the Father. There has to be a personage there. I know there will be those who say, no, 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 that, that, that's, that's not biblically sound. No, no, you're not biblically sound. Neither are you biblically correct. But John said, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. There's somebody on the throne, and that somebody has a book in their right hand. But you never see them, do you? 
Revelations 5 and 7. And he, this he, this pronoun he, is Jesus the Lord's Christ. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. You see, Jesus and the Father are sharing the same throne. Now, you never see the Father. No man's ever seen God at any time. I didn't mean to get on theological interpretation here, but somebody's sitting on a throne. They got a book in their hand, and the Son of God goes and takes the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne and puts it in his hand. So we see multiple hands of different personage, different people. You can't get around the word of God. You can't get around the truth. You see, Jesus is the manifestation of God, but Jesus is not all God. There's more to God. It's like a bucket of water out of the Atlantic Ocean. You say, that's all Atlantic water. You're exactly right, but it's not all of the Atlantic either. It's all Atlantic water in that bucket, but it's not all of the Atlantic. You see, that's man's pitiful, pathetic struggles in understanding the deity, the majesty, the greatness, the magnificence of God. We have a trouble with that, don't we? You go to heaven, you're not going to see God. You're going to see Jesus. He sets up his earthly kingdom. You're not going to see God. You're going to see Jesus. But Jesus is God. Jesus is a portion. He's from the Father's bosom. He's an expression of the Father. But there's still something there that exists and consists in all things. So Jesus, this is why theology can be so mind-boggling, is because God had to make a son to understand our humanity and something that you and I could relate to. Jesus underst he understands everything about everybody, where you are, what you're going through. It doesn't matter. Jesus fully, completely, totally understands. He understands. He understands when we can't even understand. Number two, you think you got number one figured out? God bless you. God bless you. I watched, I watched a movie, documentary, whatever you want to call it, some weeks ago, Hacksaw Ridge. The man was a Seventh-day Adventist. He kept the Sabbath. He never ate pork. His comrades beat him during training camp because he wouldn't, he wouldn't hold a gun. But on that ridge in World War II, he saved 75 men. 75 men. Not only did he save American soldiers, he saved Japanese soldiers. He saved them. Now, well, he wasn't a Christian. Why is that? He's Seventh-day Adventist. His doctrine is all skewed. It's all messed up. Let me tell you something. You cannot save, deliver 75 men plus enemy soldiers and never touch a gun and God not be with you. That, that, that is, when I watched that, I thought that man was a blood-bought, born-again child of God. No, he didn't have it right. You don't have it right. I don't have it right. God is so tolerant and long-suffering. None of us have it right. But he did righteousness, didn't he? He never picked up a gun, never shot nobody, yet by himself, by himself, saved 75 men. You see, that man to me is the Acts chapter 10, verse 35 man. You see, some of you listening to me, you think your denomination's got it all right. You know all the answers. Let me tell you, you are deceived. I don't have all the answers. No man. But Acts 10, verse 35 says, But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. I know you'll take that verse and garbage it throw it in the trash can, say it doesn't line up with my denomination. I don't care whether it lines up with your denomination or not. You've got to line up with God. God accepts people who fears him and does righteousness. That means they're saved. Only righteous people who have, the only people that do right are the people, for the most part, who have Jesus in their life, and that's what makes them do what's right. 
My God, a sinner's not going to do what's right. He's going to lie. He's going to cheat. He's going to steal, malign, get drunk, fornicate, commit adultery. He's going to do all sorts of bad stuff. So that shows he's not redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and he's not doing what's righteousness. But if he is, the Bible, Paul, uh, Peter said, God accepts him. Now, I know your denomination may not accept him. That's okay. There will be no denominations in heaven. There'll be no denominations in the millennial. There's only going to be the church, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have walked by faith and trusted the work he did on the cross. That's it. When I saw that, I thought, God had to be with that man. He didn't curse, didn't swear. Well, Brother Langford, he, he didn't do the, all the right things. Let's see you save 75 men by yourself and never touch a gun in the most, one of the most relentless battles, bloodshed, bloodshed, unfathomable bloodshed. He even saved his commanding officer. That was a miracle. God was with the man. You see, Christ today, he has the power to heal all your hurts and to heal all of your wounds. Do you hear me? You say, but pastor, my wounds, my hurts, they are so many. They are, they are you can't number the amount of wounds and bruises and afflictions that I've suffered through these many 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. I got a a note and five dollars in the mail from a gentleman by the name of George, 95 years of age. He sends five dollars a month. Five dollars. Ninety-five years old, still holding on. You see, he's never quit, never given up, keeps enduring, keeps pressing. Don't think the devil's not fighting him every day. Let me tell you something. There's coming a move of God. I'm telling you, there is coming a move of God that's going to shock the world. It's going to shock denominations. As a matter of fact, most denominations are going to miss it because they are purveyors of their doctrine, and they're not advocating the move of the Holy Ghost. I'm glad I came out of the harlot church the harlot system. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her. We're God's people, but he says you got to get out of her. If you don't, you're going to receive and partake of her plagues. Revelation 18 and 4, come out of her, my people. That t See, that tells you right there there are people that are saved. You can't be God's people and not be saved. Thus he says, come out of her. Be not partakers of her sins that you receive not of her plagues. The harlot church is going to receive the seven plagues of God. Come out of her. I'm not bashing denominations. I'm just telling you there will be none in the kingdom of God, and that's not the way to salvation. The way to salvation is through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he, Christ alone, will heal all of your wounds and all of your bruises and all of your hurts. Some of you have been hurt the greatest through your purported denomination. <laughs> I told my wife the other night, we were lying there in bed, and I said, you know, the church of God tried to destroy me. Yeah, not over sin, not because I committed adultery, not because I stole money or went out and got drunk or robbed a bank or done something. No, 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 no. They tried to destroy me because they disagreed with the revelation God showed me. If you don't think religion will kill you, go back and read the book of Acts. If you don't think religious denominational people will eviscerate you, go back and read the book of Acts. They'll kill you, and they'll say, we've done God's service. Is that not what Jesus said? They're going to throw you out of the synagogues. They're going to throw you out of the churches, and they're going to say, we just did God's work. No, you didn't. You did the devil's work. But you think it's God's work, but it's, it's not. It's the devil's work. The devil divides. A house divided cannot stand. Jesus said it's going to be the devil. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. 
killing people. They stoned Stephen. They said, we just did God a service. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm out of that, and I'm in the true church, the true body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you will continue to get hurt in your denomination. You will continue to get hurt in your organization because that's what it is. It's organized religion. It's not organized Jesus. It's organized religion. I used to rant and rave and try my best to wreak havoc in, in the denomination when I was in there. I stood up against evil. I stood up against wickedness. I stood up against wrong uh, uh, admonishments or wrong, wrong uh, f trying to facilitate a false doctrine, a heretical teaching. So finally I left. I find it amazing how they tried to take my credentials on two separate ecclesiastical trials. God intervened both times. Then when me and God turned in my credentials, I got a scathing letter saying, we pray the Holy Ghost will deal with you for leaving the church of God. I'm like, you, you can't be serious. You, you've been trying to do this for five years. You can't do it. I give them to you. Now you want God to chastise me. What a hypocrite. You got what you wanted, but you didn't like what you got because you didn't get it on your terms. You got it on God's terms. By the way, that 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 uh, state overseer, he's been dead for years now. He died a premature death. Yeah. Don't fool yourself. God will not be mocked. I thought I could get this finished up today. I'm going to pick this back up next week because there's power through the Word of God, power through the Holy Spirit of God, power through the blood of the Lamb to heal you. And that's what some of you need. And, and if you can get healed, you know, it's, it's like having a, a, a bad wound on your foot where it's, you, you've, been, you've been just eviscerated by a terrible piece of glass. And it's just mangled and, 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 and torn, uh, ripped your foot, and you've got 60 80 stitches in it. You can't walk. You can't walk. You can't hardly function. But oh, in a period of time, the healing, the healing, the bonding, the mending, it begins to take place. And as it does, as it does, the mobility to walk begins to return. Then all of a sudden you can kind of speed walk. And then you can jump up and down and you're not hurting. There's no pain. Then you get to the state and place. You can run on that scarred, wounded foot. But the scar is there to authenticate the wound. But the pain has been removed because of healing. Because of healing. I'm going to pick this back up Monday. I want to encourage you, just walk with God. Just walk with God. Walk with God and everything I promise you will be all right in your life. Again, let me remind you, Sunday, November the 1st, whatever time you eat dinner on Sunday, try to go till Tuesday before you break your fast. Through prayer and fasting, God help us to have another great election and the right person in the White House. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.